As far as me and Martha were concerned, there were some very reckless decisions being made on board that spaceship. Martha, being a stickler for rules and regulations, had even threatened to do some whistleblowing. I said, Martha, don't go blowing anything just yet. We've still got to live with these people. She rolled her eyes. Having beaten off nearly 2,000 applicants for the dream job in space, me and Martha had been expecting a glamorous assignment. But instead, we are offered a dirty old tug ship called the Nostromo. In all the excitement, we just signed the contracts. We were no ordinary cleaners, though. We'd spent years cleaning historic ships in the docks at Portsmouth. That's what landed us the job. There were only seven crew members, and most of them were friendly, except for one, Ripley. She took an instant disliking to us for some reason. I remember her shouting me back once because I'd not emptied an ashtray. I had to remind her, I said, Ripley, the deck area is a no-smoking zone for health and safety reasons. Just clean it up, she sputtered and stormed off. Me and Martha made a home for ourselves on the lower deck, along with the ship's cat, Jonesy. Just watching the stars go by, it was so peaceful. If only things had stayed that way. We were on the lower deck polishing moisture outlet pipes when the intercom beeped like crazy. It was Ripley. She shouted, Grace, Martha, upper deck, get here now. Well, Martha did not like that, she said. They can't talk to us like that. Let's make them wait. But I was curious. Come on, I said. Let's go see what all the fuss is about. As soon as we walked into the medical bay, there was a very bad vibe. Apparently, Kane had been let back onto the ship with an alien spider attached to his face. I've got no idea who sanctioned that. When me and Martha first arrived for duty, they wouldn't even let us bring home baked goods on board. They incinerated Martha's homemade Victoria sponge due to fear of contamination. <gasps> Ridiculous. Anyway, Kane had this thing stuck to his face and they tried to prise it off with some tweezers. But it didn't like that. So Ash, the ship's medical officer, thought that using a laser cutter would be a good idea. But it wasn't. The ship's captain, Dallas, came running over all of a bother. He said, Do you have anything to clean up acid? Acid, I said. What do you mean? Apparently, this thing had acid for blood and had melted the floor. Me and Martha just looked at each other and shook our heads. I said, Dallas, love, you can give me dust and coffee cup stains, but I've got nothing for alien acid. Fair enough, he said. I could see Ripley giving us a very cold stare. Oh, that woman hated us. <laughs> We were having a cheeky drink on the lower deck when the intercom interrupted us again. This time it was Dallas. He said, dining quarters now, please. Martha looked at me, she said. Well, at least we got a please this time. When we arrived at the dining area, it looked like an explosion in a butcher's shop. There was blood everywhere. Dallas pulled us to one side, he said. Kane's dead. Something burst out of his chest and scuttled off. I said, what scuttled off? He said, it was a big worm with very sharp teeth. Then Ripley suddenly appeared, looking all cocky. Do you need an explanation of what scuttling off is? Uh, no, I said. I understand what scuttling off means. It's the big worm with sharp teeth that's confusing me. She just went off in a huff again. I did feel bad, though. I liked Kane. He'd once held an airlock open for me. I thought they would at least have taken his body back to Earth for a proper burial, but no. 
They just fired him out of a portal into deep space. God knows where his body is now. I mean, where can his family lay flowers and mourn? <laughs> Things had gone from bad to worse. There was something loose on the ship. Then we heard a loud scuttling noise. Martha held up her duster like a weapon. I said, what are you going to do, polish it to death? We chuckled, but deep down I was terrified. Then we heard Jonesy the cat meowing loudly from a nearby corridor. Martha darted off into the darkness. Jonesy, she shouted. Martha, I said, be careful. I tried to chase after her, but I slipped and crashed to the floor. I could feel something slimy as I lifted my hand up. It was dripping with a horrible translucent goo. That's when I heard a chilling scream. It was Martha. Without even thinking about it, I got up and ran towards the sound of her cries. I had no weapon, just a tin of polish in my hand. As I turned the corner, I saw Martha on the floor, covered in blood. Hovering above her was this horrendous black thing, like a giant glistening scorpion, and it was ravaging my Martha. Then it spotted me. Run, Martha shouted. I did run, not away from it. I ran straight towards it. I had to save Martha. Its big black head swung around to face me and its glistening teeth shooting out and snapping at my face. I lifted up the tin of polish and sprayed the whole lot into its mouth. It screeched and roared. And I closed my eyes. I thought I was done for, but then it suddenly scuttled away in fits of coughing. Rushed over to Martha. Oh, she was in a mess. She had a big hole in her stomach. I could see right inside of her. She said, It's eaten my employee of the month badge. And she coughed out a laugh. There she was, laying in a pool of her own blood, and she still had the spirit to deliver a joke. I'll get a first aid kit, I said, but she pulled me back. No, Grace, she said. You can't fix this. Just be with me. So I sat by her side, holding her hands. She looked me in the eye and whispered, Grace, you've made everything worth living for. There were tears in her eyes. I'd never seen her like that before. Even on our 20th watch of Titanic, I was the one blubbing at the end, whilst Martha would just remind me how many rivets there were on that ship. I'd love to have cleaned that ship, she used to say. I leant in close. Martha, I said, I love you. She managed to smile. I know, she whispered and her eyes slowly closed. I was stranded on the lower deck. Ripley had triggered the ship's self-destruct countdown and the airlocks were deactivated. My only hope was a decommissioned escape pod I had no choice. I jumped in and pushed all the buttons I could. Nothing happened and then suddenly, whoosh, I must have passed out. When I came around, I was being manhandled by two semi-naked young men. Well, I thought, if this is the afterlife, I'm all in. It turned out that my escape pod had crash-landed into the ocean near Frinton-on-Sea and had been spotted by a passing pleasure boat. Young Milo and Sean dragged me on board. They kept saying, There's no way you're from outer space. I pointed to the escape pod. I said, Does that look like a rowing boat or pedalo to you? They laughed. Two lovely young ladies helped clean me up and gave me the softest pair of pink slippers I'd ever worn. Apparently, 
They cost over £500. Martha would have found that hilarious. My crusty old trotter stuffed into 500 quid's worth of slipper. We were all sipping cocktails and listening to music on the top deck when the whole boat suddenly started to shake and the sea rippled around us. The cherry in my cocktail lifted from my glass like magic. Maybe this was a dream, I thought. Maybe I'm just floating around space gasping for air and this is my brain's final farewell. And then, bang, I was snatched from the deck by a large military man and hoisted into a chopper. My slippers flew off and hit the rotor blades, reducing them to a pink mist. 500 quid gone, just like that. Back at Central Command, they gave me a proper grilling, but I was having none of it. I said, if Ash hadn't let Kane back onto the ship with an alien spider stuck to his face, none of this would have happened and Martha would still be here. We'd all still be here. Then they kept going on about the ship. Apparently it was quite expensive. <laughs> didn't look it to me. I said, it was Ripley that blew the ship up, not me. I'm lucky to be alive. They got the message. I was considered a hero back in my hometown. There were banners, parties, and my story was sold across the world. All of that attention ensured that I'd never have to work again. But none of that would bring back Martha. I had a memorial bench constructed near the docks in Portsmouth where we first met. On the plaque it simply says, Martha Pickles, out of this world. I was sat on that bench last night, gazing at the stars, and all the laughter and the memories came flooding back. I lifted my hand up and waved to the skies. I knew she was out there somewhere. Then. Just as I lowered my hand, the most wonderful shooting star swept across the sky, its tail glimmering along behind it. I'd like to think that was her, waving back. My dear Martha.